So uh, welcome to the Armchair Trader podcast and we've got a slightly different show on uh, this time because I'm here with my fellow colleague Michael Morton who joins us this week. Welcome Michael to the show. Thanks Stuart, how you doing mate? I'm doing all right. Uh, we thought we thought we'd just take this opportunity to have a chat about the last six months in the financial markets and some of the themes we've been seeing. It's not our usual format, we don't have any any external guests on to, to chat to, so um, you'll just have to put up with the two, uh, two of us for a change. <laughs> um, but... Um, I guess it's really been a it's been a sort of roller coaster six months really going back to New Year, um, as as I think we were probably expecting, and uh, we're just going to touch on a, on a on a couple of the sort of the big stories or themes in the markets that we've been seeing or which our our team has been writing about. And really, one of the big ones is um, what is now what is being called the GameStop uh, frenzy, uh, which now everybody's familiar with. But that happened earlier on this year, um, and we certainly uh, have done more than enough of GameStop on the website. It was a little bit of a watershed, I thought, for the financial markets because it demonstrated to a lot of people in 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 Wall Street and further afield that uh, social media is actually capable of making a significant impact on on share prices um, and even on commodity prices as we saw in the silver market and and that has been a trend that we're continuing to see even now uh, where we're now seeing meet what they're now calling meme stocks um, with uh, again you know Wall Street bets forum on Reddit powering some of these shares to crazy valuations What's your take on it, Michael? I mean, what, what's, what's the lesson you think people have learned from it? It's been a game changer, hasn't it? It's uh, it, it's changed the way uh, retail investors have been investing. It, it seems that it's created more accessibility to the markets. I'm sure you've got sort of far more intelligent views on Robin Hood than uh, the, the, than I have. But it's got people interested in the markets, which I think is is a great thing. Um, you know, the, the the Reddit community. There's obviously the upside that people are you know making successful trades uh, on the back of it. But obviously, you've got the flip side, and you've got people that are that are losing trades and, and, and the traditional investor would sort of probably be looking with shock and horror at the fact that people are just sort of piling into uh, its stocks because everybody's piling into stocks. And uh, But it, it just seems to be, you know, something that a lot of people now are, are, are comfortable with. I guess it's, it's not for me to say whether that's good or bad. It's, it's certainly not the way I would do things, but there's a place for it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the old adage, isn't it? As, as long as you can, uh, you know, you're investing with money that you can afford to lose, it's it's actually a bit yeah, of fun. Yeah, don't, don't remortgage the house and, and put it no. on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing, a couple of the things that struck me about it was... One one was um, and continued to strike me about it is, is this idea of commission free trading where Robin Hood, who at the time we're recording this, is just about to IPO. Buy, buy. Yeah, I mean, you can just basically buy shares um, without paying any commission. Whereas with many brokers, you, there is a cost to doing this. Whereas with Robin Hood, particularly in the US, you can be in and out of these and there's no, you know, you're not seeing a cost there. They're making their money from selling their their data and their, and their trades um, to other parties, which is probably is not. I won't get into that in any depth on this podcast. But the fact that you can trade trade for free, so to speak, seems to have been a big factor. It's just made it accessible, hasn't it? I it, I, th- I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's got people interested in in the markets, and uh, you know, got people talking. And I mean, there are others, aren't there? But you know, Robin Hood being sort of the, uh, the the key one. I think they came a cropper a little bit, didn't they? Um, uh, with the with the GameStop issue. But uh, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, for you and I, this is this is what we we set up the armchair trader for was to get people interested in 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 the markets and understanding them and 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 how they work and. Uh, you know the the fact that people were doing that is is brilliant. Yeah, yeah, no, it has certainly certainly opened up the market to a, a whole new generation of traders and investors. And I guess one of the th- what will be interesting to see is whether this was a phenomenon that was driven by the fact that everybody was locked down and couldn't go down the pub and couldn't go yeah. out to the nightclub, <laughs> and therefore it's easier to trade GameStop. It was their pub money, wasn't it? Oh well, yeah, <laughs> that's your pub money. Yeah, exactly. 
now certainly in the UK with people are allowed to go out go out and play again um will we still see that basically will will punters stick around in the market have they now got a taste for it um or, or yeah. was this just a passing phenomenon well i think as you said we're still seeing meme stocks yeah. Um, I mean, you wrote about one the other day. Uh, I think it's still there. I, I, it's probably not got the momentum. Um, I might be wrong, but uh, I'm not seeing quite the momentum that we had from from GameStop. But I've got an 18 year old daughter, and and we were having a conversation about GameStop over uh, uh, over dinner one evening, and that's amazing because uh, it's creating interest. And another another big area of interest in the, in the, f- the last six months has been cryptocurrency. I mean, where do we start with that? We saw another boom in Bitcoin. Everybody piled into Bitcoin. Elon Musk ramped it up, then decided he wasn't going to be in Bitcoin anymore because he realized it was environmentally unfriendly. And then he, he shot it down in flames again. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a bit of an issue with with cryptos. And, and, and again, this this is this is me not perhaps not being comfortable enough, prob- probably uh, maybe too long in the tooth. I don't know, you know, not not sort of trendy enough. Um, but I, I struggle with the idea of cryptocurrencies and the fact that there's no intrinsic value. Um, you know, if you look at gold, there's a there's something generally that moves the gold price. Uh, if you look at uh, stocks, then you know it's the valuation of a company. Um, with with cryptos, it it just seems to be interest. It's it's momentum for for, for people that you know are momentum traders, or, or for those that are sort of you know very bullish over the long term. Then uh, great, I'm sure I'm sure it's going to be a, a you know a fantastic uh, uh, investment for a lot of people. But I just I just don't get it. I don't know why the price moves, and that scares me as a more traditional investor. I I have to agree with you. I mean, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, I can see a degree of utility with. Bitcoin has filled a niche that was was there. There was a demand to be able, I hate to say it, but there was a demand to be able to move money around the planet without people really being able to see you do it. Yeah. And there are all sorts of people, and I'm not just talking about organized crime syndicates here, but there are all sorts of people who, for one reason or another, you know, the utility is there to use Bitcoin to move it, move money in and out of the financial system and around the world without the spreads you're going to get in FX or or tax or whatever other oversight it is. And this may be what's what's troubling some of the regulators yeah. at the moment. But some of these some of these uh, cryptocurrencies which we've done some we've done quite a bit of analysis on on some of the more niche but very popular coins in the last six weeks. Some of them, you know, when you go and look at them, I mean there's nothing there. I mean some mm. of them are powered by there isn't even a full time team working on them. Even the developers are a part time. Yeah. Frequently, there doesn't seem to be any real use for these things other than to try and mimic Bitcoin or to try and be the next Bitcoin. But there's already a Bitcoin. You don't, you know, fundamentally, you look at it and go, I'm not going to name names here, but you can go on our website and have a look at some of the crypto analysis we've done in the last couple of months. You just have to ask yourself, who's going to use this? Who is going to use this? It's just yeah. people trying to punt something that has fundamentally no utility at all right now. The guys trading it are just don't understand, you know, what's powering the price. I don't understand what's powering the price, and and with a lot of the a lot of them, you, there, there's no office address, there's no obvious corporate entity, there's no one to contact, there's no press release, there's no IR, there's just nothing. It's just it's just a thing. <laughs> yeah, an electronic currency that's uh, that's been created. I, I, we we should sort of say at this point, if if there is anyone listening and, and hoping to get some nuggets on on cryptos from from two middle aged men, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> none from me, I'm afraid. There are good and bad. I mean, in summary, there are good and bad coins. At the end of the day, it's like yeah. anything else. Yeah. There are yeah. good and bad companies. Um, and there's a big difference between the U.S. dollar and and um, a currency issued by a small Central African country, and I yeah. think people need to take that attitude when they're talking about cryptocurrency as well, because some of the, you know there's Bitcoin and there's Ethereum, and then there's all a lot of these other sort of minnows yeah. in the crypto pond you know some of which could have potential but others of which are just going to disappear i, th- I think um uh you, you meant you touched on uh the fca 
earlier. And obviously over here in the UK, it's very hard to get access to cryptos through um, ETFs or, or, you know, obviously through, through CFDs, spread betting. You can buy them through crypto wallets. How do we feel about that? I mean, you should, do, do we feel that, you know, people should be uh, able to, to get exposure to, to cryptos more, more easily? I, I think so, yes. Um, particularly something like Bitcoin, but some of the others as well, you know, like the top five or six. And, and institutional investors can do that. But the FCA has taken the view that the market is too unpredictable, too volatile. They've banned CFD brokers from offering leverage trading on, on these currencies, which I can see the sense in yeah, uh, yeah. just because it would be highly risky to try and trade something like that with a CFD, even if you're looking at 10 times leverage, let alone something like 100 times leverage. The The issue with, for me is, is, is also banning the ETFs because I actually think the ETF as a structure is a lot safer for, for an investor than investing directly in Bitcoin through a cryptocurrency wallet. You can get in and out of an ETF faster than you can physical Bitcoin, yeah. Um, without many of the other problems, and the ETF, the ETF providers themselves are regulated, yeah, and they're trading on a regulated market. So to turn around and ban the ETF, but at the same time, anybody can can go and buy Bitcoin directly on a, on a, you know, through a cryptocurrency exchange. Um, you know, you can do it tomorrow, but you can't buy an ETF, folks. That just seems a little bit of a dichotomy to me. I guess the, the, the other thing, and we've sort of talked about this a little bit before now, is uh, is looking at equities as a way of sort of uh, getting some exposure to, uh, to to cryptos. You know, I get you, the, the, there's always that opportunity, I guess. Yeah, so that's the other, that is the other option. Uh, you can buy shares in some companies that have a high degree of exposure to um, the digital currency space. There are some now listed on the market we've written in the past about argo blockchain cypherpunk there are going to be others out there as well and we'll probably be looking at some of those in the second half of the year but certainly those are companies just like a mining company that's mining gold is by definition exposed to the gold price so these companies can you know they might be mining digital currencies or they might actually hold digital currencies or they have stakes in companies that are in themselves you know wallet providers or such like that's something that you can actually just go and buy it's not a pure trade like buying a bitcoin etf but it does that those those share prices will reflect some of the big trends in the in the, in the cryptocurrency market and, and i think you know you, you and i sort of speaking about this you know about how we feel about cryptos but the fact of the matter is they're here and they are important and and they probably should be in some way part of a diversified portfolio so uh maybe there is some uh some interesting stuff that's that's come from from our uh, <laughs> our chat <laughs> and i wanted to move on to copper next because copper is a di- very much a thing right now we um, if you're a regular armchair trader reader you will know that we we have been talking about copper a lot um we cover some Uh, interesting copper miners and explorers on a regular basis Uh, the reason we do that is um, we think that there's there's a lot there's a big story for copper at the moment the data that we're seeing as well coming out of the asset management industry is that there are a lot of big investors trying to build up their exposure in copper including pension funds and hedge funds the copper price is is basically looking like it's going to stay above historic highs and it's very likely that it's going to go even further one of the key drivers has been the the fact that copper is seen to be a commodity that's going to play a big role in the future of green energy so there's a little bit of a strange dichotomy here because you have some people saying whoa copper mining don't like that that's not esg friendly it's not environmentally friendly in fact i don't like mining at all but at the same time there is absolutely no way that this green energy revolution and and the drive towards zero carbon emissions is going to be achieved without a considerable amount of new infrastructure and when you're talking about electricity you're going to need copper. Yeah. What do you think, Michael, on the on the copper side of things? Well, it's it's massive, isn't it? I think um, it is part of our f- sustainable future. 
uh, as you say, it's, it's quite ironic that, you know, we, we have to mine for it. But uh, in everything, if it, this electric revolution is going to rely on, on metals, conducting metals to, uh, to, to enable us to, uh, to move to where, where we need to get to. And I'm imagining that uh, demand is, is going to be outstripping uh, supply. It's an interesting place to to look at, and again, whether whether you're looking at copper as a uh, as an ETF uh, or as a commodity, or whether you're looking at it as an equity from a miner uh, of some kind, it's uh, I think it's got to be seriously looked at in a portfolio. It's the future. We did. We have literally just done a podcast with Mark Fanry, who is uh, CEO of Wedgemount Resources, which is a copper explorer in. British Columbia, which may either come out in front of or behind this podcast or in close proximity to it. So it's worth listening to that one as well. If this even sees the light of day, Stuart. Yeah, yeah, no, this will see the light of day. <laughs> oh, no. But he, he's, an interesting, he's an interesting chap because he's he's got a background in corporate finance and mining. But uh, on that podcast, we had a we had a discussion about you know, the copper boom and, and just how much the mining industry is becoming focused on this now and how... You know, a lot of smaller copper operations like like Wedge Mount or Kodiak Copper are just being followed very, very closely by the mining investor community. Um, so it's definitely going to be one one to watch in the uh, second half of the year. Um, and then and then another big theme uh, in the first half of the year, particularly in the first quarter when we were all in lockdown here in the UK and feeling utterly miserable about it, um, was the massive amount of interest, which is still there in certain biotech stocks that are deemed to be either developing solutions in the COVID space, because obviously we've not really talked about COVID very much, but that's been a dominant theme in the first half of the year, as you would expect. And there have been a number of biotech stocks. I'm thinking of Novasit, for example, off the top of my head, Avacta, either developing fast tests yep. or um, treatments around um, the symptoms of COVID. Um, obviously, there was a lot of uh, interest in guys like AstraZeneca because and Pfizer because they were the ones rolling out the vaccinations. But there are a lot of other biotech operations in the US and in the UK that are listed and where they are in the process of developing some of the solutions to COVID. I think a lot of investors piled into these early on because they rightly saw that there would be a demand for effective testing. Mm. And uh, there are several companies we've written about on the website that have technology that is going to facilitate the ability to test people for the presence of COVID virus. And as, as we're sitting here now, um, we're seeing that a lot of people are placing more emphasis on this kind of technology and, and how you can test people getting on and off planes, going in and out of a nightclub, going to school. If COVID's going to stick around, that kind of technology is going to be virtually priceless once it gets rolled out. Yeah. What, what's your, what was your takeaway on, on, on this? Because there have been several companies that we've been tracking that have just gone to the races with, with the valuations on them. Well, they have, haven't they? There's, there's been a number that we've been tracking over the last 18 months that uh, have been doing fantastically well. But obviously, it, 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 their fortunes have sort of been tracking the, the almost the news flow to an extent. So as as we've come out of lockdowns, um, they've 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 not been quite as trendy, and and then they've you know as as lockdowns have have come back in, then then they've come back into fashion. Prices have sort of gone up and and down as a result. Generally, uh, the trend is is obviously positive for a lot of them, um, particularly when they're getting government contracts and and things like that. Yeah, the, the the fact of the matter is, COVID is here to stay, isn't it? Certainly for uh, you know for for a while, and uh, you know it's it's something that we're going to have to live with. You know the, these these suppliers, you know to testing PPE uh, and the treatments and things, they're going to be very very important for a while to come. So uh, I think you're going to see continued interest in, in these guys, you know, may, maybe not quite to, to the extent that we have seen, although we don't know, do we? You know, it's who, who knows, you know, another variant or, or, or anything, you know, let's let's hope not. But, uh, you know, we just don't know. So uh, certainly here to stay. You know, it's, speaking about COVID, it's just it's it's been eighteen months, hasn't it? It's uh, <laughs> I'm losing yeah. the will to live. With it. <laughs> we can cut that, can't we, Graham? <laughs> yeah. The um, I guess that one of a couple of things that surprised me about the bio well, the biotech industry. It's one of those industries 
traditionally, you know, you really don't have to understand the science to be able to make a proper evaluation of whatever the drug is or the testing solution is that the company's coming out with. But we've seen a massive amount of, of retail interest in, in, in some of these. You know, guys like Novacit, for example, if you look at the volumes on in that over the last six months, still for, for a company of that size, it's just been sustained interest. It's just high. Frequently, it's because they have a solution already and they just have to try and yeah. tinker with it and, uh, and, and then make that actually effective in treating or testing for covid um but a lot of some of these companies we've written about in the biotech space have been tiny mm. tiny companies with massive interest in in the um in the share price and um um you know the, there's like two guys or three guys in the company i mean it's literally that small um but but what they're working on is where there's the massive interest well, I wonder, I mean, we, we talked before about GameStop and, and I wonder if, you know, obviously the, these were, you know, themes uh, from the first lockdown, you know, where people were sort of just, you know, investors were piling in, you know, on the promise and, and on the momentum. It's a similar story, really. And, uh, you know, just seeing people, you know, interested, understanding where the, I, I want to say opportunities, that's not the right word when you're, when you're looking at uh, COVID, but, but from an investment perspective places to to uh to put your money and 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 following the momentum it's they, they've just provided a great opportunity for for a lot of people and and you know actually when when you're looking at you know a lot of people were furloughed and and everything else you you, you hope that you know that it's been been a positive thing for for a lot of people to be able to sort of you know use use the markets because obviously um you know with the first lockdown uh there was a big drop in the markets uh initially and we've we've seen that ride back up and then then some over the last uh last 12 months uh or, or longer so you know with with people jumping in to the markets as they have been then you you'd you like to think that you know if you're patient uh, in particular or or if you're riding momentum then uh, you've managed to make a, a go of things, and if if you have, then you're going to be more interested in continuing that as well. No, absolutely. Final point on biotechnology: we did a very interesting um, podcast with Elsa Craig, who's one of the managers of the International Biotechnology Trust, and we we put quite a few questions to her about the biotech sector. Yeah, that was really good. Um, and now, uh, finally, because my uh, my voice is going, but uh, still on the subject of COVID, I mean, we're coming up to the up to the summer holidays people are wondering whether or not they're going to be able to to travel um go on their traditional holiday abroad or whether they're going to be stuck with a bucket and spade holiday in the uk the travel sector if, if there is one sector that's been really hit hard uh, i mean obviously retail and, and the hospitality is another one but the travel sector has been hit extremely hard but it's still suffering isn't it whereas retail is has, has now opened up exactly yeah retail's opened up hospitality's opened up travel international travel um and tourism and particularly the airline business um um seems to have, have really suffered from covid and uh, we've seen um you know massive drops in, in in price in stocks in the airline industry um but again at the same time unprecedented interest in well, one of the ones that really amazes me is is carnival and um some of the other cruise liners where we we saw sustained investor interest for months and months it's amazing yeah that and the cinemas basically seem to be two of the, the the really favorite areas for investors who are prepared to get in and stay in because they obviously anticipate that that at some point there's going to be a, a rally yeah yeah, I mean, we've been speaking about this for for a while now. It must be people looking at, at the long term or, or looking at momentum because it's been continually uh, driving forward. But same as you, quite quite incredulous with the uh, you know with the cruise liners as as they are at the moment. I think I think I read um, that they're just starting to plan dates for uh, things to start back up again. There, it'll be interesting to see what kind of appetite there is in the early early days based on the potential for risk if you're of a certain age and you know if you haven't had your vaccinations and uh, it's just an interesting one i find it fascinating because that we we were seeing interest investors interested in carnival say just taking one example i mean the royal caribbean was another one mm. back in like february march time um, and there was a lot of investor interest in these companies and at that time it did feel what on earth are these people <laughs> what are they thinking about here 
because a cruise line industry getting back to to profitability just seemed a crazy prospect at that stage and there was also the worry that some of these these companies are burning through their cash reserves as well yeah that yeah you can't keep a company with assets like cruise liners on ice indefinitely no and if you look at the so i'm just looking at the share price in new york for carnival corp if you were in there in february you were rewarded you know it was maybe down at about 18 19 dollars and it's currently at 25 but you would have got you would have got up to 30 dollars there so you were up from say you know at that point when we were talking about it back in february you could have got up from 18 to you would have got a decent return already and yet looking at the cruise line industry still really not off the ground isn't yeah, it yeah it's incredible it is incredible don't 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 know how to explain that one <laughs> <laughs> i mean the the airlines is the other the thing with the airline stocks we've seen is that the, the airlines they go up and down depending on you know where we are with the virus and where we are with lockdowns and and all it takes is for Boris Johnson to stand up and make a speech and, and they'll go up or down dependent on on that. Well, they have been really driven by what's going on with the virus. Well, this this is the problem, isn't it? Things change on a, on a daily basis. I mean, people were booking holidays and, and, and arriving uh, at their destination uh, abroad and, and, and finding that when they get back, they're going to have to quarantine. Confidence is, is not high because of the continuous changes. It would be interesting to see how, how long it takes for, for the airlines to, uh, to get that confidence back from from uh from from holiday makers but again this this is this has been a toughie obviously they've been rallying the uh the, the government the travel industry um to to try and uh you know make something of this summer but it, it seems a little bit late to be sort of trying to claw back the uh the revenues that that they would have made if if they've been open for for 12 months it's another tough one i mean what what do you do do you jump back in when when the government makes the call or or you know are you in early um, and the expectation that that things will start to uh, to rise. The smart money would be to be in, I would imagine, when uh, before any kind of announcement comes in. Yes, and, and and I think if we, you know, as we're looking back over the last six months, the the real, I mean, if you take something like um, uh, IAG, which IAG we know a lot of a lot of investors like, mm. that was down at about the sort of GBX one hundred and sixty price, and and I think the big that was in mid February. Big surge for that was the gradual prospect of a gradual, phased, um, unlocking of the economy. So then people had a roadmap they could see, and they yeah. could say, okay, by July things should be almost back to normal. And so that's when you saw that the surge in 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 the. I mean, a surge. I mean, yeah, okay, one sixty up to um, you know maybe maybe two hundred two twenty. Mm. I mean, it's still it's still not to be sniffed at. It's come off, but you see that's the key. Now, it's IAG shares have come off a bit in the last mm, sort of ten days or so before we record this, and uh, again that's because there's a little bit more uncertainty. Um, everyone, I think, part of the mentality was the UK's opening up. That's great things are returning to normal but then when you look at the airline sector in particular actually it's not returning to normal because there are other rest- in, you know it takes two to tango a plane has to fly from a to b what are the conditions like in b that's right it's not easy you know speaking of someone who's whose flight on easyjet just got cancelled yesterday thank you easyjet <laughs> <laughs> i knew that's where this was going <laughs> 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 uh, it is unpredictable it is really unpredictable and if you're an airline you can't switch an airline on like a light switch you can't just get all that all those pilots all that cabin crew back in the air straight away yeah. even if they drop all international travel restrictions tomorrow it's going to take the airline industry months to get back up to speed again uh, months yeah so uh, it doesn't surprise me to see the iag share prices slipped a bit in the last 10 days or so well maybe there's an opportunity coming up yeah yeah watch that space watch that space there you go so i mean that's that's really all i wanted to talk about you know in our in our six month review uh, was there anything you wanted to add michael well, obviously it's been a, a really interesting period the last six months it's it's been been hard for a lot of people for a lot of very different reasons the markets for me personally have been uh, a bit of a salvation i guess because it's kind of 
some normality in amongst everything else that we've been going through, you know, with restrictions on our lives and uh, and everything else. So it's been, uh, you know, for me, really good to be able to focus on something. And obviously, you know, the, the markets have generally been on an upward trend, particularly in the uh, you know, recent short term. You know, all of this interest that we're seeing, we've seen a lot of it, you know, coming onto the armchair trader. And, and, and thank you to anyone who's listening and has been supporting us. Uh, you know, we, we really appreciate uh, your your support it's enabling us to do a lot more which which i hope you're finding valuable and uh uh and useful and, and and giving you sort of ideas on on where you um would be looking to invest or trade and uh for, for giving us the opportunity to do more of this which is something that we love uh and and, and inspires us so uh yeah thank you very much thanks to our subscribers if you're subscribing to our, our daily newsletter on the website uh or indeed if you're subscribing to this podcast um thanks for listening we will be taking a little bit of a break on the podcast over the sort of late july august period but the plan is we will be back um in september with a vengeance Stuart. with a vengeance with a vengeance, <laughs> with a vengeance. but um yeah no and certainly season two will be will be starting in september and we'll have some more interesting guests on at that point and um if you're very lucky we'll be able to persuade michael to come back on as well at some point or not <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant thank you Stuart. thank you thanks everybody You've been listening to the Armchair Trader podcast. Make sure you visit our website, www.thearmchairtrader.com, for your daily dose of financial markets news and sign up to our free newsletter there.